so I have quite a few slides and some I'm just going to uh, breeze over and if any of you have questions afterwards you uh, feel free to approach me. My husband always says, please don't make them feel like they're drinking from a fire hose. So I will just sort of glance over some of it. So I wanted to talk to you about the TRIO BD study that we just uh, published, treating insulin resistance as a strategy to improve outcome in treatment resistant bipolar disorder. I have no disclosures. I'm very grateful for the grant support from the Stanley Medical Research Institute who funded this trial. I wanted to start just with a few slides as to how I got to this place where I felt the need to treat insulin resistance in order to get my patients better. The first study I did as a resident in psychiatry, and what we found was that there are very high rates of overweight and obesity in our patients, and we found that there was a relationship with response to lithium, the sort of gold standard treatment in bipolar disorder, and so those who had a more healthy BMI had complete response to lithium, those who were overweight had a partial response, and those who were in the obese range had no response to lithium. And this didn't make sense to me. With lithium being, not being a fat-soluble drug, we titrate to therapeutic blood levels. I felt like there was something right in front of me that I was missing. And what that happened to be, I learned, was insulin resistance, because doctors don't test for insulin resistance. I did family medicine for 10 years prior to going into psychiatry, and there were no medical indications to test for it. So what we did was we systematically tested. And by measuring fasting glucose and insulin and using the homeostatic model assessment insulin resistance equation, we were able to stratify patients into three groups, those who were euglycemic or metabolically healthy, those who had insulin resistance, and those who were type 2 diabetic. And what we found were that 54% of all patients had insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes being an insulin resistant state as well. And as well, 40% of those with type 2 diabetes were diagnosed by me in my psychiatry clinic. So they were being missed by family medicine as well. And this is significant because it had an important impact on psychiatric clinical outcomes. And so looking at some of those outcomes, we see in the uh, bar graph to the left, the much higher percentage of bipolar patients with insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes had a more chronic course of illness as well as uh, more rapid cycling. And we see that the insulin resistant group had uh, equally poor psychiatric outcomes as those with type 2 diabetes. So in my mind, there was this narrow window in time that we had where we could intervene in the insulin resistant state before they went on to becoming um, type 2 diabetic and possibly more difficult to treat from a mood standpoint. We also found that those who were metabolically healthy tended to have full response to lithium, which you see here in green, compared to no response uh, seen in pink. And again, the insulin resistant and type 2 diabetic groups look similar with poor response to lithium. We found that as insulin resistance increased, basically response to lithium decreased. So we wondered which came first. Is it the worsening bipolar disorder that leads to the insulin resistance, or is it the insulin resistance that causes the sort of progression of bipolar disorder to a more chronic treatment-resistant state? And so, unfortunately, in Canada, um, medical records or psychiatric records are destroyed after seven years. And so we were able to scrounge around and find six patients with complete medical records from onset of illness. We see that each horizontal turquoise line represents a lifetime course of illness for a single patient. The red vertical line indicates the onset of insulin resistance or the first recorded abnormal elevated glucose level. And we see here using the effective morbidity index, which takes into account the duration and severity of episodes, we see to the left, the upward black bars represent mania, the downward depression. We see a lot less illness activity to the left of the red line compared to the right. And in fact, psychiatric morbidity increases 12-fold following the development of insulin resistance. So we believe that insulin resistance may modify the course of bipolar disorder and promote neuroprogression. So this sort of led to the logical question for me was, well, if we treat the insulin resistance, do we get patients better? And so this was a parallel group, intent to treat, random assignment, metformin or placebo, one-to-one -one ratio, quadruple mass study, two sites. I was the uh, PI and sponsor uh, for the site in Halifax, and Roy Chingapa, my collaborator in Pittsburgh. We had all the appropriate approvals. It was on clinicaltrials.gov, and again, uh, funded by the Stanley Medical Research Institute. Our hypothesis was that compared to placebo, metformin would reverse insulin resistance significantly among treatment-resistant bipolar depressed patients, and the reversal of insulin resistance would result in significant improvement in TRBD and associated clinical outcomes. So we were not looking at metformin, whether it was a better antidepressant than placebo. We were looking at if we resolve the aberrant underlying mechanism, is that how we would get patients better? 
So our primary outcome was a change in depression rating uh, scale scores. We used the MADRAS, the Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale, at 14 weeks, and then comparing converters, those who no longer met insulin resistance criteria, to those who uh, still were insulin resistant, we refer to as non-converters. There were additional outcomes we looked at, the GAF, CGIBP, the Hamilton anxiety rating, and we also looked at improved outcomes up to 26 weeks uh, follow-up. Inclusion criteria was basically twofold. You had to have treatment-resistant bipolar depression, and you had to have insulin resistance. You could not yet have type 2 uh, diabetes. You could not be in full-blown mania or have rapid cycling. You obviously had to have uh, capacity to consent to treatment. This is our consort diagram. Um, we were able to analyze for safety and efficacy 20 patients in the metformin arm and 25 in the placebo arm. Our schedule of assessments, just to highlight that the MADRAS was our primary outcome and at 14 weeks, and that we did the MADRAS rating scale amongst many other um, variables that we looked at, and the HOMA IR at every visit. And so we were looking at comparing the HOMA IR uh, to the MADRAS improvement. So we treated patients with 500 milligrams of metformin uh, with breakfast and supper for one week, and then titrated up to the uh, full dose of one gram BID. We allowed for a slower titration for tolerability issues, although it was very well tolerated. No subjects withdrew due to tolerability issues or lack of compliance, and adherence was good, 97% in both treatment groups. So this is the interesting uh, part. So 89% of these patients had a chronic uh, course of illness, had had no remissions for more than 25 years. So this is incredibly sick population. They had failed eight to nine different psychotropic medications. They were on two or three that they had fi failed by the time they were coming to see me for the trial. They had not only been on those medications for a minimum of four weeks at stable doses, which was one of the inclusion criteria, they had been on these drugs for months or years with no improvement. 64% had been on disability at some point in their lifetime. Most of them were currently on dis uh, long-term disability when I met with them. Again, 89% had a chronic course with no remissions. 11% did have an episodic course. Over 90% had failed drug trials from at least three of the psychotropic drug classes that we use, and uh, more than 55% had failed all four drug classes. The inclusion criteria was a madras of at least 15, and the mean madras was 28. So these patients had moderate bordering on severe depression, and GAF scores were less than 50, so serious symptoms or impairment in ability to function. So we defined converters as those who had reversed their insulin resistance, so a HOMA IR score of less than 1.8, and we found that 50%, and this was interesting for me, because as a family doctor, using metformin as first-line treatment for type 2 diabetes, it always worked. It brought glucose down. But bringing glucose down doesn't mean that insulin comes down as well. And so it was a surprise to me that only 50% of those on metformin reversed their insulin resistance. But those who did reverse um, their insulin, insulin resistance got better. We had one in the placebo uh, group manage to reverse their insulin resistance on their own. And they had told us afterwards that they had embarked on diet and exercise and they were able to sort of get their home R below 1.8 and they also improved. So again, it speaks to the mechanism. So here we looked at response to treatment as a 30% improvement in MADRAS, and we see that the converters shown here in blue, more than 80% met that criteria of at least a 30% improvement, and we used that 30% because this was a treatment-resistant population that we were working with, and you can see that much fewer of the uh, non-converters met that criteria. We see here, looking at the converters in uh, blue compared to the non-converters in orange, that by week six, we see a, a significant improvement in the MADRAS through to our 14-week uh, primary outcome endpoint, and it, that carried through to the 26-week end. And here we see the estimated marginal mean change scores between converters and non-converters from baseline to 14 weeks with a change of 8.42 and a large effect size of 1.17. And again, the marginal mean change between uh, converters and non-converters between baseline and week 26 was 7.45, with again a large effect size of 1.04. We looked at anxiety at um, you know, week zero uh, prior to, to treatment, uh, week 14, and then week 26 at the end of study, and we found significant improvements in anxiety at both week 14 and 26-week uh, endpoints. And with the HAM-A, we also found that between the converters and non-converters, between the baseline and week 14, the estimated marginal mean change of 4.73 with an effect size of 0.61, which is uh, still large. 
and a mean change of 7.8 between baseline and week 26 between converters and non-converters with a, a Cohen's D of one. So we also looked at functioning, and usually when you see an improvement in mood and anxiety, you're going to see an improvement in functioning. And we did see that with the improvement beginning uh, at week six in the converters compared to the non-converters carrying through to our primary outcome endpoint at week 14 and again to week 26. And um, the estimated marginal mean change between converters and non-converters um, from baseline to week 14 was minus 10.52 with an effect size of 1.47, very large. We see the non-converters here in orange. This is the GAF that many of you will be familiar with in terms of the global assessment of functioning. So from serious symptoms to still moderate symptoms, but um, those who could manage to convert to become insulin sensitive had a much greater improvement to just having mild uh, impairment in functioning. And again, when we look at from baseline to week 26, very similar findings, marginal mean change of minus 11.3 and a large effect size 1.58. The uh, non-converters had a small improvement and a large improvement in those who were able to convert to insulin sensitive. So we conclude that reversal of insulin resistance by metformin significantly improves depression, anxiety, and general functioning in a significant percentage of TRBD patients in both the short and intermediate term. And I can say now, uh, because the majority of these patients I follow in my mood and metabolism program, and we're six years out, and the ones who had first started, then they're still well, they're still in remission. I didn't show this data, but reversing insulin resistance uh, with metformin not only offers a way out of TRBD, uh, there was no risk of mania, decrease in suicide ideation, and the adverse effects were equal to placebo. Limitation was small sample size. We had 45 subjects. That means we don't have enough data to look at some of these things in more detail. Um, I did want to get to this slide because this is the first patient coming out of the TRBD study. We didn't know whether he was on placebo or metformin, and we didn't know whether he had reversed his insulin resistance. But he came out asking me, could he please be put on metformin as a trial? And of course, everything pretty much we use in psychiatry is off-label. This is a very safe drug. So I thought, sure, let's try it. Why not? So another mechanism that we've discovered is that extensive blood-brain barrier leakage is associated with chronic course of bipolar disorder and treatment resistance. And so we imaged this gentleman's brain prior to starting him on metformin. And so this you see uh, dynamic contrast enhanced with uh, gadolinium, extensive leakage uh, of his blood-brain barrier. These are multiple sections through his brain. In the, in the left section, he's insulin resistant. His madras is in the mid-30s, which is severely depressed. Within 12 weeks of being put on uh, metformin, his blood brain barrier had completely healed. He was no longer depressed for the first time in five years and no longer insulin resistant. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank our patients and their families and a large group of collaborators uh, that I work with. And just go back to this slide. I have to say that there's no greater way of fighting stigma in psychiatry than showing this. I mean, this really shows this is an illness of the brain. And the patients get it, their family members get it, they're able to then give the support that the, the patients need because they're able to better understand it. And certainly for the public, they have a much better understanding, I think, of what we're talking about. Thank you very much.